guys ready? All right. All right, I'll do, I'll do the whole banging thing again. All right. Good afternoon. I am Council Member Acosta Constantinidis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, and today the committee will hear three bills addressing sewer system maintenance. I want to recognize first, we have uh, two of the colleagues who sit on this committee, Council Member uh, Rafael Espinel from Brooklyn and Council Member Carlos Manchaca from Brooklyn. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, today we'll be hearing intro 424 in relation to reducing sewer system backups, intro 425 in relation to requiring the city to prepare a plan to prevent sewer backups, and intro 268 in relation to backflow prevention devices. The City Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, is responsible for managing the city's sanitary sewer system, which includes 14 in-city sewage treatment plants, and 7,500 miles of sewer infrastructure conveying 1.3 billion gallons of sewage every day. In addition to the identified sewage infrastructure, the DEP maintains approximately 148,000 catch basins. The DEP operates the system pursuant to the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation State Pollution Discharge Elimination System permit and recently more, more proactive and maintain the system with digital tools and innovative practices. The SPDES permit mandates that the system be properly operated and maintained in, consort in, in accordance with the terms of the permit. If the system is not properly maintained, people are exposed to sewage backups in basements, streets, and yards. In August of 2016, the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, found that the DEP experienced an excessive number of sewage backups between 2011 and 2015, more than 17,000. There are also numerous instances of repeat backups in the same locations due to capacity issues or infrastructure maintenance. Sewers can, sewage can contain a number of biological hazards, including bacteria, funguses, parasites, viruses, blood-borne viruses. Exposure to sewer backups can result in a variety of adverse human health effects stemming from exposure to pathogens such as E. coli, shangliosis, salmonella, G giardia, cryptosporium, uh, lamlia, and hepatitis A and B. It's almost as hard as saying my last name. <laughs> On August 31st, 2016, due to significant number of confirmed and unconfirmed sewage backups, the EPA issued an administrative compliance order based on its conclusion that DEP's wastewater treatment violated the Clean Water Act. The EPA ordered the DEP to prepare an operation and maintenance plan for its collection system, and that was approvable, and then upon approval, immediately commenced implementation of the approved O&M plan. In May of 17, DEP issued a sewer backup prevention and response plan. The plan focuses on three areas operation and maintenance, grease, and a new proactive data-driven sewer inspection program called Targeted Sewer Pilot Inspection, TSIP. The Sewer Backup Prevention and Response Plan uh, does not address the presence of tree roots in customers' lines or the department infrastructure. There's been ongoing conversations regarding who should be responsible for sewage backups resulting from intrusions into sewer lines from city-owned trees. DEP determined grease was the root cause of the most confirmed, confirmed sewer backups. There is also evidence that broken catch basins may have had an impact on sewer backups. Local Law 48 of 2015 required DEP to inspect all of its catch basins annually. By the end of 2017, DEP had inspected 98.3 of the more than 148,000 basins in the city. The first mandated report pursuant to Local Law 48 of 2015 identified thousands of catch basins that were clogged and broken. The most malfunctioning catch basins were located in Southeast Queens, with Community Districts 11 and 13 showing the highest numbers in the city, followed by Community District 12. The EPA suggested DEP should further explore the cause of sewage backups to ascertain if any relationship between the increased sewage backups and clogged and malfunctioning basins. Regarding backflow devices, uh, they prevent cross connections between potable and non-potable water. In order to carry out its responsibility pursuant to the public health law, DEP, as a supplier of water, must determine if a facility poses a potential hazard to the city's water supply. 
if a city if a facility should pose a hazard due to its operations, the DEP commissioner is required to direct the installation by the owner of an approved black flow device prevention system. Uh, intro 424 require the DEP to maintain to take maintenance measures needed to assure when a sewer backup occurs more than once at the same location within a 12 month period. The portion of the sewer system causing the second or subsequent backup of identified and clean within 10 days of such subsequent backup. Intro 425 would require by December of this year, the DEP commissioners submit a plan to prevent sewer backups to the mayor and the council. Such plan is to be posted on the DEP website. And intro 268 would improve transparency and efficiency in the installation of backflow devices and enforcement for failure to install backflow devices. Uh, thank you to our uh, attorney, Samara Swanston, and our policy analyst, Nadia Johnson, for help putting this uh, hearing together today. And now we will hear from the administration to be sworn in. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? All right, please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Constantinidis and members of the committee. I am Anastasia Georgelis, Deputy Commissioner for Water and Sewer Operations in the New York City Department of Environmental Protection, D DEP. With me is Michael DeLoach, Deputy Commissioner of Public Affairs and other DEP staff. Thank you for this opportunity to testify on these three bills. Introduction 268, relating to reporting on backflow prevention devices and introductions 424 and 425 related to sewer backups. The Bureau of Water and Sewer Operations, BWSO, oversees approximately 14,000 miles of water and sewer mains and 150,000 catch basins in New York City. Our work includes day-to-day -day management of the underground water and sewer infrastructure, emergency response to events like water main breaks, as well as capital planning and oversight of water and sewer infrastructure projects. Intro 268 of 2018 would repeal and replace existing provisions in the administrative code relating to reporting on the installation and testing of backflow prevention devices, BPDs. Protecting New York City's public water supply is of, of paramount importance and backflow prevention is one aspect of affording this protection. I would like to mention that DEP's extensive water quality testing and monitoring program is the frontline defense in ensuring the quality of water in the distribution system. New York City tests its drinking water in a distribution system for approximately 240 chemical constituents, well above regulatory requirements. We perform more than 1,100 tests daily, 34,000 monthly, and 400,000 on an annual basis on over 36,000 samples collected from about 1,000 sampling stations throughout the city. Test results are reported to our regulators and are summarized in our annual report on the quality of New York City's drinking water. While we agree with the intent of this bill, we would like to work with the council regarding new reporting requirements related to backflow prevention devices and replacing subdivision D of section 24-343.1 of the administrative code. DEP has developed a comprehensive cross-connection control program in which we first concentrate on those facilities representing the highest risk of possible contamination of our public water supply through cross-connection. To assist building owners, we are constantly upgrading our program guidelines, most recently in May 2017. We have made extensive efforts in the identification, inspection, enforcement, and reporting of backflow prevention devices. Since 2012, we have reorganized the program by setting up individual units within the BWSO that focus on specific areas of expertise. The three units are inspection, enforcement, and cross-connection review. Our active program far exceeds our commitment to New York State Department of Health, and we continue our progress towards ensuring that any facility that requires a backflow prevention device has one. DEP also maintains an active database compromising 
comprising records on some 104,258 properties, up from 101,033 properties in my testimony last October. The number of properties tracked in this database is dynamic and changes due to the nature of the property's usage profile. We have been compiling more detailed and current information about the number of buildings in the city that require backflow prevention devices via both data mining and field inspections. Small residential properties, such as one to four family homes, are not a subject of concern. Our approach has been to target our inspection resources more efficiently and by identifying the types of commercial and residential properties that are most likely to pose a risk. Our inspection unit uses a GIS mapping system along the information from the Department of City Planning to generate a citywide map that targets potentially high-risk areas and buildings. Each year, we aim to inspect 4,000 properties citywide. For calendar year 2017, we conducted 4,569 inspections. The results from these inspections were 1,104 properties did not require a device, the remaining 3,458 properties required actions from our enforcement unit. In calendar year 2017, the enforcement unit sent 2,263 commissioner's orders, of which 1,882 properties were newly notified of the need to install a backflow prevention device, and 381 were for the need to replace a broken device, install additional device, or plans previously approved but no record of an installed device. In calendar year 2017, 956 NOVs were issued for failure to install a device. Additionally, the enforcement unit processed 6,440 NOVs for failure to conduct the annual test. As it relates to the review process, in calendar year 2017, our review unit received uh, our review unit reviewed 6546 initial test reports for newly installed devices and an, and an additional 41172 annual test reports for existing devices we continue to enhance our knowledge by employing inspectors in the field to do the labor intensive job of inspecting previously identified properties as mentioned earlier, we agree with the intent of this bill and we would like to work with the council regarding new reporting requirements. Moving now to intro 425, which would require that by December 31st, 2018, DEP submit and post on its website a plan to prevent sewer backups, SBUs, and intro 424, which would amend the administrative code to require that where an SBU occurs more than once at the same location within a 12-month period, the portion of the sewer system causing the second or subsequent backup is identified and cleaned within 10 days of such subsequent backup. Over the last decade, DEP has shifted from a reactive to a proactive data-driven approach to operating and maintaining the sewer system. DMP employs the principles of adaptive management to continually improve our sewer maintenance program while balancing our overarching responsibility to deliver a high quality drinking water and treat wastewater every day in an affordable and sustainable manner. DEP also targets its efforts on reducing the amounts of fats, oil, and grease fog discharged to the sewer system. These efforts include regulations that mandate the use of grease interceptors in certain commercial establishments, such as restaurants, as well as extensive public outreach to inform New Yorkers about actions they can take to prevent the improper disposal of grease into the system, a primary cause of SVUs. DEP, staff, DEP stepped up its fog outreach efforts in 2015 to inform the public about grease problems in sewer infrastructure. To date, we have reached over 80,000 households in targeted communities throughout a combination of activities, including door-to-door -door canvassing and workshops with community organizations and local houses of worship. Additionally, our education staff conducts classroom and assembly programs 
and has developed a special curriculum for teachers on the topic of grease and its proper disposal. We have established a compliance consultative program focused just on food service establishments. And DEP has just recently initiated a behavioral change advertising campaign with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to further educate residents in all neighborhoods. We have also reached out to other utilities to ensure we are using the best practices of the industry to reduce fog to the sewer system. Throughout the city, there are park areas that experience repeat sewer backup complaints. In these cases, we use it analytic tools to identify streets that have a higher frequency of sewer backups. Once we identify these streets, we conduct a detailed inspection to identify the root cause of the backups. Since 2011, we have done this robust analysis on over 2,500 2, locations. Once a root cause is identified, we de deploy a targeted programmatic cleaning program to resolve this issue and monitor the site to ensure the sewer continues to function. If further issues arise on a site within 12 months, DEP will employ an even greater level of evaluation to identify what other contributing factors may be causing the sewer backups. Since 2012, DEP has done this level of analysis on 541 locations. Over the last 10 years, we have seen a 49% decrease in total sewer backup complaints citywide and a 70% decrease in the number of confirmed sewer backups citywide. Starting in July 2017, we began a three-year pilot program to conduct targeted sewer inspections in parts of the city that have a relatively higher rate of SBUs. The targeted areas we have chosen for this pilot program are Brooklyn Community Boards 13 and 15 and Queens Community Boards 12 and 13. We're currently finishing year one of the pilot program and have completed our inspection target of 10,000 sewer segments. We will use the information gleaned from these 10,000 sewer segments and those we inspect over the next two years of the pilot to deepen our understanding of the traits specific to these locations and what has caused the repeat complaints. Together, intros 424 and 425 mandate identification of locations with more than one SBU during a 12 month period and ensuring cleaning within 10 days. However, our three year pilot incorporates escalating levels of response and investigation, which will allow us to accurately determine the causes of the increased rate of SBUs in our targeted areas. Understanding the root cause is a prerequisite to developing the solution. The most effective remedies flow from understanding the problem. The static timelines of 424 and 425 will not allow this. We have committed considerable resources to this pilot and have collected a year's worth of data. Legislation requiring us to shift focus to locations with less frequent SBUs will interfere with the progress of our pilot. We must be allowed to properly diagnose the root causes and then develop appropriately targeted remedies, which can involve cleaning, flushing, degreasing, debris removal, and vacuuming, to name a few. To do otherwise is backwards. We need time to complete our analysis of the data, and we need to continue our methodology as is to keep the integrity of our data. We will be glad to share our <coughs> insights into root causes, best remedies, and best timelines as our pilot progresses. However, we ask the council not require that we experiment with arbitrary cures before we finish identifying the disease. Given DEP's robust commitment of staff and resources that has resulted in demonstrated success in continuing reduced SBUs, we ask that the council defer actions on intros 424 and 425 until the completion of the three-year pilot in 2020. We are committed to keeping the committee apprised of our efforts and findings and welcome your comments and recommendations going forward. Again, thank you for this opportunity to testify. I will be glad to answer any questions. I recognize uh, we're joined by Councilmember Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn as well. All right, so how much is the budget for your outreach relating to degreasing? Uh, I don't have a figure. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think we have a total figure based on salary and all the different costs that go into it. We can definitely pull it together for you. Okay, I definitely want to know I how much we have, we're 
what sort of outreach we're doing and where, how much we're spending. Is that something we just went through a whole budget process? Yeah. Is, is this something we have to increase in the future? Uh, you know, how often are we going before community boards and where? Because, um, I mean, I know that in the past you said that the Greece is probably the largest reason for backups, correct? Yeah, about 70%. So if, if that is the cause of the backups, then I, I would hope that we're proportionally spending dollars to do that outreach, um, considering you know it's 70% of, the, of it, that we're saying, right? Yeah, correct. And a lot of the, so we focus a lot on Southeast Queens on the outreach, but we're, gonna, we're working with DOH right now on doing a bigger campaign citywide to make sure that we educate a bigger you know, section. So what, what, what have we been doing in Southeast Queens? We've been going to um, community board meetings, NYCHA meetings. Uh, we've been in the classroom with our education department, educa ed educating young people. We have giveaways called Cease the Grease that have all kinds of different things you can use to mm -hmm. get, get rid of grease properly. We go to all kinds of you know, community events, family days, et cetera. Uh, so we're, all doing, we're doing all that sort of outreach. And yeah. we have, we've done a ton, so I can pull together sort of an overview that, and give you the... We have a specific staff of four that are going out doing it. So. Oh, great. If you can send me sort of, yep. sort of, sort of a, an overview of what they've been doing over the last year or so, we Absolutely. can kind of like look at it as a committee. Thank you. Sure. Um, how much is caused by debris? I don't have that figure in front of me, but after Greece, debris is the next uh, largest bucket. Are there things that we can do that are avoidable in relation to debris, or it's just people, it, is it coming from our catch basins? Like where, where is this debris coming from? Uh, debris. People th flushing things down the toilet. I mean, what, where is the debris coming from? It could be stuff getting into our system through a, an open manhole or something, but it's just as the sewage goes through the process of traveling to the wastewater treatment plants, sometimes it's just settlement of whatever is in the flow. Do we have any idea why people are either placing debris or grease into our systems? Is it, is it lack of knowledge? Is it tradition? So what, what are our thoughts on how this is, why this is going on the way it is? So I just think it's uh, behaviorally for the most part and people when they have grease in their kitchen, they like to dispose it probably the easiest way they can and be pouring it down the drain, which is what we'd like to encourage them not to do and try to package it somehow where they could dispose of it properly. Have we thought about doing something on the subways or the buses to tell people that's a bad idea? Yeah, that's what we're working with DOH now to do a big okay. campaign with all those different components. And when do we expect to see that? Uh, at the earliest, probably fall, but I'm assuming probably the beginning of next year. We're just starting the, to put out an RFP to get a creative team to help us sort of best describe it. Okay. But it's and gonna be substantial. I don't have, we're not, I don't think we've, finalize the budget yet, but it's definitely going to be a big campaign that will, again, reach citywide. And what's our social media effort uh, uh, when we, it comes to this? Yeah, I mean, we, our social media doesn't reach, isn't as efficient or effective as some of the other agencies, but we definitely are posting about things and, uh, you know, educating people about how to properly dispose. But the main thing that we're doing is going out into the communities and giving the, the stuff that holds the grease so that you know, we think a lot, largely people don't know what to actually do with it, so we're trying to give people something to use to, to put it into, and that's we're going to continue to expand that and do more of that. So, I mean, for the work that we've done thus far, um, how would you sort of feel the impact is of your you know, Cease the Grease campaign in, in, the, in Southeast Queens and other areas that you've focused? It's hard. I, I can't quantify it in terms of actual results in the system, but I do know that just, you know, going out and being around, we've engaged with so many people that, you know that people are being educated and are aware. I don't know how it actually translated into actual infrastructure. So we have had a decrease in the number of SPUs over the decade. SPUs have dropped. Sewer backup complaints have dropped about 70% over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't point my finger exactly that it's changed in behavior, cleaning methods, the way we're approaching it, but I think it's a combination of everything. I mean, so, does the current mapping system and applications provide for adequate display of uh, sanitary sewer system components and applicable features? If we have a map of our yes, mm -hmm. our sewer system, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, is it, we is it an updated map? Or we do we feel good about where that map currently is and how we're able to sort of track what's going on? Yeah, we have a robust GIS system that that sh could show us all our sewer infrastructure. 
All right. And then I mean, the question I have relating to my last question on this, and then I'll just quickly do some backflow stuff, and then I'll pass it on. And I see that we're joined by uh, Councilmember Richards from Queens. Um, good to have another Queens member in the house. I was feeling a little lonely. <laughs> um, but you know, how do we reconcile um, the large number of complaints and, and issues in Southeast Queens with also the large number of catch basins um, that are inoperable there? So in, in Southeast Queens, the catch basins that you're, you refer to as inoperable, a lot of them are seepage basins, which aren't connected to the, the sanitary or the storm sewer. They were mm -hmm. just big dry wells, basically, and the water would just percolate into the ground. Now with the big push for bringing storm infrastructures to Southeast Queens, the mayor committed to spending $1.9 billion. Mm -hmm. That's where we're gonna actually start building the storm infrastructure in Southeast Queens, and that should help a lot with the flooding and actually have the catch basins connected to our storm sewer, which currently they're not. So it's just a coincidence that we have these two large, these sort of numbers and of large numbers of catch basins not working and large number of backups. It's yeah, um, unfortunately, Southeast Queens, some of the infrastructure has trailed to keep up with the pace of uh, development. And with this big push on the this, on this storm infrastructure so it's going to come, it should help with the flooding and the catch basin issues. And right. it's, in addition, we have, we've realized that in certain parts of Southeast Queens, we have problems with sewer backups. And that's why we, we targeted our uh, pilot program to incorporate community ports 12 and 13 in Queens. And I'll, and I'll come back to that piece on my second round. Um, I'll just go into the uh, issue of the backflow devices. I know the big the issue for me is that we are seeing, I know you had said that your one to three, four family homes are not our concern, but the larger buildings are. We see development all over New York City. Large buildings going up on a consistent basis. Um, how are we keeping up? Because uh, I see we're inspecting about 4,000 buildings a year and our number is about 150,000. So how are we planning on keeping up with the need um, with so many new buildings coming online, large buildings that could potentially need backflow devices? If we're only doing 4,000 a year, how are we sort of keeping up with the pace here? So after 1987, it's required that any new building coming up that requires a backflow prevention device has one installed. Okay. And prior to that, DOP won't give them a certificate of occupancy without That's it being in and we do an inspections to make sure they're there, but prior to construction? Uh, we don't inspect uh, the buildings. I think they filed with the Department of Buildings, and they issue us a certificate that it's installed. So it's the first, uh, uh, the, the inspects, the tests, they show us that it works, and then they have to file annual tests from there. Okay, so they have to, there's some mechanism. There's accountability. There's accountability that we have. So really, yeah. the buildings we're talking about now are buildings that are pre-1987 yeah. buildings. And after this issue, the notice of violation, we're going back and doing inspections afterwards? Or they have to provide some sort of evidence to DEP that they reconciled these? So they have to, f they have to file with their uh, records that their plan on to install it. And then that after they install it, they have to give us that document that's from a certified plumber that they've installed the device. And, if, if, and they won't have the violation removed until such time they show us that, that certificate they that they've installed? Correct. Okay. And what building types present a higher than average risk of cross connections between potable and non-potable water? So on our website, we do have a brochure that explains the process and it lists all the different types of uh, buildings that are at a higher risk and the ones that should have the device. Uh, if you give me a moment. Mm -hmm. So it's auto body shops, beauty salons, butchers, chemically treated boilers, dry cleaning establishments, uh, buildings with large boilers, booster pumps, hotels, motels, guest stations, heat exchangers. Pharmacies is a whole list, and it's on, on, on our website that shows you which And it's these, are, these are the, the locations that we're most concerned about. Correct. And if a older building has a new use, that's one of those uses we're also requiring them to submit before they can sort of take, before a pharmacy can move in or some other kind of other business can come in, they have to have a back, they have to have that certificate. 
So they're, 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 they're required to install a backflow prevention device, and that's where our inspection team focuses on so, you know, the buildings and then what their use is, and then we'll see if maybe their use has changed over time, and that's when we'll pick up sometimes where a building doesn't have the device and we issue them an order to install. All right, because you have an older building, it used to be, you know, you know, very often a, a, a drugstore or something else will take over a, a clothing store, which may not have been a backflow, you know, needed device, and all of a sudden it's, you know, it's, it's a, something that needs one. Yeah. So we're going in there and making sure that they have it, correct? Correct. Okay. All right, great. With that, any... All right. All right, so I'll, this time I'll turn it over to Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for my tardiness. I was uh, sitting next to you at, uh, at Technology across the street, and you, got to, you got to leave a little earlier than I did. <laughs> um, uh, Deputy Commissioner, I have a question. Uh, your testimony... Um, uh, at the last page says the static timelines of intro 424 and 425 will not allow you to have enough time uh, to develop the remedies necessary to identify the problems, understanding the root cause is a prerequisite to developing the solution. It goes on to say we need time to complete our analysis of the data and we need to continue our methodology as is to keep the integrity of our data and then you go on to say um, that you ask the council to defer actions on intros 24, 424 and 425 until the completion of the three-year pilot in 2020. Okay. Well, some of that's a lot of lawyer speak. I'm a lawyer, so I recognize where there's lawyer speak. Um, but 2020 is a long time away from now. And what we've asked you to do in our bills, uh, one of which I co-sponsor with our chair, is um, uh, specifically intro 424, um, to take maintenance measures needed to assure that sewage backups occur no more frequently than 50 per 100 miles of sewer line, including quarterly cleaning for at least once a year. But specifically, it says that if more than once in a 12, this is the, the layman's version of it, because I'm not an expert like you are, if more than once in a 12 month period, um, a particular sewer system line requires, um, or has a backup, then we would require you to identify and clean within 10 days of the second. So in other words, you get one free pass for there to be a broken thing. You know, it's an old system, we understand that. But the second time it happens, you gotta do it within 10 days. Why is that not good? So what we have selected, the community boards that are in our pilot program are the ones that exhibited the largest number of SPUs per 100 miles of sewer. And what we're trying to do is even prevent that one instance of an SBU, because to me, no, no SBUs are, are, are a good thing. So that's what we're trying to do, is we're going out, and th this has been a change in the way we've approached it in the past. We're actually going out and proactively inspecting all the sewer manholes without any complaints coming in. So the idea is to hit all the manholes in those four community boards twice over the next three years. And from the data that we collect, we want to find what's, what's happening from when we inspect it today and then in a year from now when we inspect it, what's the condition in the sewer? Do we find debris going? Is the flow moving as fast as it can? And we want to use those, that data that we collect, on, uh, and we're going to capture the size of the pipe, the type of material, when it was installed, and then we're going to take it and see which segments have experience an SPU after we've inspected it, after we've cleaned it, and, and the frequency that we'll get an SPU, then we're gonna try to use that data to find out if there's any kind of a pattern. So if we could find an idea or what's causing or where we have the more frequent pro uh, problems, then we wanna develop a program where we're gonna go out and try to maintain those segments before we even experience a backup. So, so I don't, right now it's kind of early, but we might find that certain sewer segments we have to go to every three months or every six months and flush. Maybe it's every two years. So but the goal is to manage not having any SPUs in those areas. So there's a lot to the, to the question you asked, but I'm assuming the 10 days on the second one is particularly what you're the most, what you're interested in, right? So specific to the 10 days on the second one, I think we already meet or... So when we, when we get a sewer backup complaint through 311, our target goal is seven hours. So in general, we respond to any complaint that comes in 
within, right now I think we're about four hours. So we'll come out, inspect the sewer, and perform, perform some type of cleaning activity within that time frame. So we're not, yeah, we're not talking about the response time that we want to negotiate with you on. It's more the time, the, the time of the actual SPUs over time, right? Four, 424 is a very simple law. Um, it says, the Commissioner of Environmental Protection shall ensure that where a sewer backup occurs, occurs more than once at the same location within a 12-month period, the portion of the sewer system causing the second or subsequent backup is identified and cleaned within 10 days of such subsequent backup. You're beating the goal. You're doing it by seven hours. We're giving you 10 days. You should, you should be happy with this. We're giving you a little more time. So just going out and cleaning it isn't finding the root cause. Looking, <laughs> looking and finding the root cause could take weeks Deputy or months Commissioner, sometimes. we want you to find the root cause. There's no doubt about it. We don't want to get in the way of your work, but what we're saying is we're giving you a hard stop deadline of 10 days. 10 days to get it done, the second, the second clean, just to clean it, just to get it operational again so that people's sewers are not backing up into their homes. Um, you know, and going to the pilot program that you discussed, uh, you know, pivot quickly to that. I don't want to monopolize all the time because I have colleagues who, who want to get in some questions and the public wants to talk. Um, but you identified, I believe, uh, four community boards, two in my borough, uh, two in Queens. Um, one of those boards happens to be one that I have a tiny amount of representation in. Um, it's community board 15. But uh, community board 15 is surrounded by Community Board 11, Community Board 13, Community Board 12, Community Board 14, Community Board 18, Community Board 10, they all have around the same number. Uh, and, and I notice this as I look at the map of sewage backup uh, complaints, which is in our committee report, and um, uh, I'm sure that you have access to it. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the, the community boards with the most number of complaints, or with whatever number, whether it's the low number or the high number, they're all clustered around the same number. So. You know, Manhattan all the way up through Central Park, uh, all the way up really to the, to the top of Washington Heights. It's all in the 100s from 101 to 112. And then the Bronx, it's on the entire Bronx is basically from 201 to the, the 220s. And uh, where I represent, it's, you know, 311, 315, 312, 314, 318, 310. Uh, up north, uh, where my colleague, Councilman Espinal, 301, 302, 306, 307. Uh, and then in Queens, of course, it's up to 400. So, but it's all clustered. It's all the same, around the same number. Every community board has around the same number. So it's not about whether, I mean, to me, because I don't know anything about sewers other than that they're down there and we flush <laughs> into it. Um, but to me, it looks like, you know, we have 300 or thereabouts in my neighborhood sewer complaints. This is 2016. I'm not saying you broke them. I'm just saying it's a very old system. And what we're saying is that if in 10 days, in after a 12-month period, if there's another backup in the same place within 10 days, get it fixed, I don't think it's like a heavy lift. But the disconnect is that you're saying cleaning it. That doesn't equal fixing it. That's what we're, we're, that's what we're trying to make clear. Then you, you want us to write in the law, fix it? We'll write in the law, well, fix we it. Wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to, I mean, you can write it in, but I don't think we'd think we would be able to necessarily do that. Like he was saying, sometimes these problems take weeks to fix. So. If you want us to look, go look at it and try and start figuring out so what it is. So, so, so let's brainstorm together because you're here and I'm here and mm -hmm. you know we write the laws, you obey them, I guess. Um, what if we wrote in the law that within 24 hours of getting the complaint, you got to get in the ground and look at the sewer and then within 10 days, you have to come up with a plan to fix it and it's got to be done within 30 days. And I think that's no good. much worse than what's, what's what your what number? you actually have Give me the, the number. I, I don't think we can, we can quantify fix. I think that's too difficult to do because well, there's such different instances. It's all different depending on what the SBU is. And the second one might not be the same cause or a, a impact from the first one. They could be totally unrelated. Uh, and no question. And that's why we're using that the the, uh, the barometer as because we have to pick something. You know, we can't, right. we're not going to tell you every single sewer break in uh, or sewer backup in the entire city of New York, you have to get it in there and fix it within 10 days. Right. But what we're suggesting is that if there's a sewer backup within a particular place within a, partic within a year, within a 12 month period, it's indicative to us as laymen, you know, nothing council members that maybe there's a greater problem you need to get in there. And what we're saying is we want to put a hard deadline. So what I'm asking is give us that information that you would you would be okay with legislating. There's gotta be something, because otherwise we're gonna just pick a number and then you're gonna have it. So right. what we're saying is give us the number that makes sense. What is it, 10 days, is it 11 days, is it not fixed, is it repair, is it 
investigate it? Is, is it speculate? Is it map it out? Right. What's the right wording? What's the right number? It can't just be council members go away till 2020, and in the meantime, people's sewers are going to back up, and we'll come back to you in three years, and we'll give you an answer as to what you should then legislate, because some of my colleagues are leaving office in 2021, and they would like to, I'll still be here, but sorry, but they would <laughs> no, like to, good. you know, have this resolved, and this, you know, I was on a community board for 18 years, and I could tell you that in my neighborhood, um, uh, and I could, I could do it almost by block, I know when it rains, where it's gonna back up into people's houses, and it's, it's not because you broke the sewer system, it has to do with the fact that houses that were built for three people are now having eight or nine or 12 people living in it, that single family homes were knocked down and six story condos were put up. It's, it's, that, that is the city of New York, That's, we know that. But we also know that that means that the sewer lines have to be addressed. What we're saying is that in 12 month period, you already know that one thing happened, we're suggesting that during that period after the first thing happened, you've identified, you've gotten in there, surely within the 12 months, you know, three months later, you've taken a look, you figured out that there's something, it's a bigger problem. We need to replace a mile worth of lines, four miles worth of lines. We need to, we need to bring in a horse and buggy to whatever, something. But it, there's gotta be a number and there's gotta be the wording that you're okay with. So that's why I'm asking, don't just come down here with respect, uh, Deputy Commissioner, and say, um, defer action, I promise you the council's not gonna defer action. There, there, there are members here who, who have been hearing this. Uh, the chair, this is, he's, he was on the council in the last term. Um, the other sponsor of the bill was on the council in the last term. I'm a new guy, so I don't really know anything, uh, but folks wanna get this done. And uh, again, I, I was on a community board for 18 years. Uh, uh, before that, I worked for a borough president. I worked for a city council member in the 90s. Uh, this is not a problem that started yesterday, but it's been getting worse and worse and worse. It doesn't mean that you haven't been addressing it, but it means that we need to come up with some kind of legislative solution that says, this is the barometer by which you measure whether or not a thing needs to be done. What that thing is, we don't know. Is it not repair? Is it fix? Is it inspect? Is it, what is it? So come back to us and tell us, and we'll do, we'll do right by the agency, but we also have to do right by the people who are frankly having sewage back up into their houses. And by the way, um, I am a renter, so it's luckily never really affected me in the sense that I've had to pay for it. Um, but uh, you know, anybody who knows anybody, my parents have had sewer backups in the home that they live in, the home that I grew up in. Um, you know, everybody has this in every neighborhood and I could literally identify the blocks in, in my neighborhood, in my neighboring council district, uh, probably the three council districts of surrounding my home because it was all on my community board, uh, where these problem areas are over time. So I'm, I'm not that smart. If I could do it, you guys can do it. And we're saying give us the information to help you, to help us craft a law that you'll be comfortable with, but that we're able to turn to the communities that we represent and say, DEP knows what they gotta do, they're on the job. Understood, and we're definitely anxious to share that information and have a conversation about how we can do that. Super, how, how soon will you tell the chair what language you'd like? Because it's his bill. I mean, we're talking already, so I think, you know, I think we'll, we'll do it quickly. Quickly, okay, perfect. Um, uh, I'll, be, I'll be real quick on the second question, Mr. Huh, Chair. No, you, you got my full That was, that was one question, by <laughs> the way. You're advocating for my bill pretty well. I'll, I'll, you can um, please continue. I, and I appreciate the <laughs> indulgence of the chair and not putting a clock on me, um, uh, but I will be very quick. Uh, question, uh, my second question involves the second bill, uh, 425. Okay, all we're asking for is a plan. We're not asking you to do anything. We're just asking you to come up with a plan. It doesn't even have to be a good plan. It could be a, a half thought, incomplete plan. It could be anything you want, but it's a plan. And we're saying by December 31st, 2018, you're already deep into this because you already have the pilot going, you have your data going, you're crunching the numbers, you're doing it on a daily basis. We know that your folks are working really hard. You're asking for us to defer action on 425 until 2020, and all we're saying is give us a plan, and what's the right answer for that? Does that also have to wait for two years? We're willing to work with the council on, on whatever you think is best. We do have online now, we call it a state of the sewer report, which we've been, we had started in 2012 and 13. We stopped for a couple of years, but we have put it on the last two years that do describe 
programs and give metrics broken down by borough on how we're performing. Now, if the council can look at it and see if that's adequate for, or if you want to do something additional, then we can look at doing something additional. But we think that, that that state of the sewer report is a good snapshot of what we currently do regarding sewers. Does that uh, report, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pretend I read it because um, I don't want you to catch me in a lie, but uh, does that report indicate a schedule for the citywide rollout of remote sewer monitoring devices? No, it doesn't. Okay. Does that plan indicate a citywide assessment of the impact of fat soils and grease on the sewer system? I know you testified earlier that you're working on, uh, on engaging New Yorkers on better ways to dispose of uh, the materials that should not properly be thrown down a drain. Uh, fully support that for my own the garbage. I'm sure that doesn't make the garbage chute happy, but I do not put it down the drain. More New Yorkers need to do that, of course. But do you have a, does, does that report indicate a, a citywide assessment of the impact of fats, oils, and grease on the sewer system? It does mention what we do regarding the fog. Okay. Does that report indicate a, a uh, an identification of areas with, on average, more than one sewer backup in a 12-month period? No. Okay. Does that report indicate a targeted cleaning and maintenance schedule for areas with, on average, more than one sewer backup in a 12-month period? No. Okay, so we're giving you some great ideas, I think, um, uh, and, and uh, Chair Constantinides, and I, I will sign on to that bill now because uh, I generally do not like to sign on to reporting bills. I think that um, uh, when legislators get involved in the business of mandating uh, uh, the city agencies to stop what they're doing and write us letters, it gets in the way of your good work. But I think here we have a situation where, um, where I think your reporting by December 31st of this year, which is six and a half months from now, uh, would give us a barometer by which we could measure not just your good work, because I know your work is good, but whether or not we can give you legislation that would give you the, the uh, broad picture of what it is we anticipate and expect that your agency could be doing. Um, so I will sign on to that bill, Mr. Chair. Um, but, but my question again is, you know, you've asked us to defer uh, for, uh, doing 425 until 2020, that's two years, two and a half years from now. What what would be so bad if we ask you to give us a report by December 31st? I mean, do you need till January? Do you need to February? Do you need to March? What's good? What would be so bad if we asked you to, within six and a half months, give us some kind of report? I mean, it's not going to be under oath. I assume it's going to be truthful. We're not going to call you back and, and, and bother you about every paragraph, but some kind of general report back on how you guys are doing. Because, because what you do now, it, you do have a report, which I haven't read, but it doesn't hit any of these items that, uh, well, with the, except, with the exception for a citywide route control strategy, subsection 6 of, uh, of subsection B of section 24501, 3.1. So that's, that you do, you're working on the route thing. But you can tell us a little more, right, by December 31st. It's not so, it's a little long. I mean, I, I have to do reports all the time. We can work with the council to see what kind of report. All right, all right, have. okay, all right. That's look. I appreciate very much what you guys are doing, and I, I don't want don't don't take my um, my uh, Brooklyn snark or lawyer lees to uh, to be indicative of disrespect for your work because I do know that by the way that uh, when a district manager in my neighborhood calls DEP about a sewer backup, you guys are there within a day or two. Uh, you're out there. You're you're looking into it, and sometimes what we think is a sewer backup is actually DOT's fault. Uh, for for not doing the street well enough or not re not keeping the street in well enough repair that's causing ponding. Our immediate thing when we see a puddle is it's DEP's fault. We know that's not true. Um, and so I, I will say that publicly. I will also say publicly that um, I know on the on the community boards that I represent, uh, particularly uh, in, in uh, southern Brooklyn, you are responsive. That is 100% true. Anybody who says otherwise has to meet me outside. But what we're doing is we're giving you some barometers, I think, uh, Deputy Commissioner, that you can, you can wrap your arms around and get back to the council so that, that at least we can pretend that we're doing something for the people who sent us here. We will. I just want to clarify one thing. I think the work that we're doing in the pilot is going above and beyond, and it's actually going to lead to long-term solutions, and so we're anxious to get the data and, and figure out what the actual solutions are as opposed to coming to you and saying it could be these different things when we know we're going to know over time. So if you if there's a way to sort of give you updates to the work that we are doing to show how we're going to get to the overall remedy to make sure that we're reducing SVUs, I think that's sort of where we're anxious to, to talk and figure out there's compromise. Okay, so that's before a having the grand plan, before we actually have all the details, we want to 
make sure to show you what we are doing to get to the end goal that's a shared goal for both of us, but not maybe put the cart before the horse a little bit. Okay, we don't like to put the carts before the horse. We don't even like to use horses anymore. Okay. We're not allowed to in the city. Um, but what we, I think that's a good idea, and I think you, you can discuss with the chair and with council to the committee of how we can structure that a little better. But yeah. what, what I'm saying is that you're already deep in, into this uh, investigation, uh, inquiry, uh, work involved to do the root cause thing. What we're asking for is, with the exception of the root cause, which is asking for stuff that's already knowledge, I mean, it's in your information, you know, how often does, is, is the sewer backed up on Avenue M and East 19th Street is the kind of thing that you can pull up with a couple of buttons, I assume. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Yeager. I appreciate your advocacy. Um, and I'm just to piggy on back, uh, piggy up, piggyback on that before I hand it over to Councilmember Richards, I will say that uh, I am concerned, I was going to say this in my uh, second round, but uh, it's saying upon your completion of your three-year pilot in 2010, which doesn't mean you're asking us to defer till 2020, you're actually asking us to defer beyond that because you have to then look at the data from your three-year pilot plan. So we're talking about you're asking us to, with, you know, to defer until sometime in 2021, correct? Uh, yeah, I, I think we're flexible on the timing. I think we want to get to a point where we feel like we're getting toward critical mass of the data. But so I, 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 2020 is something that I think you know, we're totally yeah. flexible. And so I think we, we're looking uh, forward to accelerating that timeline. But let me again pass this on to my colleagues and continue the line of questioning. Uh, Councilmember Richards. Thank you, Chair, and I promise to be uh, really short, unlike uh, someone who said they're going to be short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, thank you, uh, uh, Commissioner. To Mike, thank you for, for being here. Um, so let's hop into Southeast Queens for a second. So, so obviously we pass a catch basin bill. Can you speak to how many catch basins we have successfully cleaned um, in Southeast Queens this fiscal year? Uh, not specifically Southeast Queens, but our inspection cycle is ending on June 30th. And I believe- So you don't break that, you wouldn't have a breakdown I don't have it, by- I don't have it memorized by, for you by areas. Right. We okay. could get it, but okay. what I'm gonna say is we last time I checked, we inspected 143,000 basins. And you did so it based on what? Why are you doing it? <laughs> because you asked us to inspect them annually. Okay. Because the city council doing. passed a what? They passed a, a local a law. law to yeah. make you better. Yeah, and there what, you go. what we're doing <laughs> is, and and, and to, to to your credit, we last year we took out uh, somewhere around double the material we did the prior year. So we are cleaning a lot more basins. We're inspecting them. Mm -hmm. and, and I do want to give you credit because I saw complaints. you outside. I saw you on Brookfield Boulevard cleaning out just yesterday. And I was like, look at this. This is a miracle. It's happening. But go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Good you know, work. And, and, uh, and our street flooding complaints have dropped. But Southeast Queens is still a leader uh, in this area. And I know what you're going to give me, that old Greece complaint. Because Southeast Queens is the only place with Greece in New York City. So can you, do you act, actually have, and, and I know you spoke to some of this stuff in the bills, but can you break down or give us an indication, what are you really doing around degreasing if grease seems to be the reason, only in Southeast Queens, it's the number one reason for, for sewer backups? So, so grease is an issue all over the city. It's not, I don't, okay. for my mom, it's not just, so it's not Southeast, Southeast so you're not blaming Southeast no, Queens it's, specifically it's, anymore for this issue. It's a right. that's, that's a change. It's a citywide issue. Okay. What we do that's have good. is when we go out to complaints regarding Greece and we find that it's a repeat uh, backup where it comes multiple times and every time it's from Greece, what we do is we put those segments on a program. So we call it the liquid degreasing program. So what we do is depending on how severe and how frequent the backups come out, we put it on a program and put it on the frequency where we think we're gonna be able to prevent those backups from happening again. So we might have locations that we come out every year, okay. and what we do is we flush the sewer, but while we flush the sewer, we, we put uh, a liquid degreaser in the sewer to break up the grease. Okay, now you said might. So do you not, why not have a more robust schedule around dealing with grease? But maybe I threw a mic, but it's not. We do put it on a program. So it could be annually, and I have locations Could be that is not is. So could be and doing is two different things. I'm a stickler for language. 
So when we find the problem is Greece, okay. we put it on the program. Okay. So in, in Queens, in the whole Queens, I know he's got the majority of the locations that are on this program. But if Greece is a 70% of your sewage backup, so is, is that correct? You're saying yep. a, a cause of 70%, would that not, why might or could? Why wouldn't you come up with a more definitive plan? If that is the root cause that, according to you, is the, the major contributor to sewage backups. I mean, the root cause for, for large a lot of this is actual infrastructure, right, Tasso? So the fact that we're spending $1.9 but billion the department has in Southeast Queens to No, listen, I'm about to get into a, that. Is a can, priority. But i got to start with the hard question first. But reduce. according to you, at least where catch basins exist, 70% of sewage backups so are because in, in of... Primarily in Southeast Queens, the catch basins are seepage basins. Right. They're not connected to the system. Right. So they're just going to the that. ground. So the mm -hmm. grease and the sewers and the catch bases aren't interrelated. Now, the $1.9 billion is going to be a good start on building the storm infrastructure in mm -hmm. Southeast Queens, where we can get those catch mm -hmm. basins that currently aren't hooked up to the system, mm -hmm. get them hooked up to the storm sewer, and we'll get those basins functioning. Now, as seepage basins, we know that those mm -hmm. are dry wells, and it just takes time mm -hmm. to percolate in the ground, and because of the Soil conditions in Southeast Queens, they haven't been as effective as other parts. Now, do you of the city. differentiate and do you have a different plan to address seep? So that sounds like that needs to be where you put the emphasis. That that, if that's the seepage out, basins are. Go ahead. That's how, why we're building out the storm infrastructure. Right, right. But in the meantime, if the seepage basins are the biggest issue, are we addressing those they're not more? They're connected to the system. I, I know, I know what a seepage. I, I, I get it. I used to chair the committee. But yeah. what I'm saying is, do you not have a more aggressive approach towards seepage basins if that seems to be the number one contributor? Uh, I mean, well, not contributor, but since you're dealing with seepage basins in Southeast Queens opposed to catch basins, do you treat them differently, or do you treat them all the same? This is what I'm saying. So we'll inspect them, and we. They, we maintain them with limited capabilities. Mm -hmm. So if, if we could clean them, we'll clean them. If or do you? If, if it's going to help. Sometimes if or do you? He's answering your question. It, it, depends, on the, it, de it okay. depends on the nature of the, okay. of the seepage basin. Some are not fixable. They're past some, their prime. Some the, exactly. Some of the seepage basins have passed their, their prime, or they've had limited uh, mm -hmm. time, time, li mm -hmm. time lives. Mm -hmm. So if they've exceeded it, mm -hmm. then I, it, we can maintain it every day. It's still not going to function any, right. any better. Now, there's no new model of seepage basins out there that other municipalities are using. If we're still sort of stuck in the 70s and 80s, I think, in terms of our infrastructure there. So, and in the meantime, and once again, very appreciative of the work um, that the department is doing and your commitment and the mayor's commitment with $1.9 billion. But in the meantime, some of these capital projects are going to take a long time um, to get off the ground. So in the short term, are we looking at newer technologies? Are there um, some new models of seepage basins since we still have some that have been in the ground since 1970? Are you entertaining changing them? Or are there seepage basins that could have a bigger footprint that would, would give you a, deep, a bigger impact? So that's what I'm trying to get at. Or are we just so stuck in, well, this is what it is? The soil, the soil conditions in, in that part of Queens isn't conducive to any. I don't want to hear that answer. Have we looked but at what, newer? What, okay. what we what we have been doing mm -hmm. is working with finding the locations that are the biggest problem regarding flooding and mm -hmm. ponding, and mm -hmm. trying to come up with alternate Creative. solutions. Mm -hmm. And that's where we try to extend mm -hmm. the sewers and try to get them connected to some kind of drainage system. And that's the only way you're effectively mm -hmm. going to really drain the system. And mm -hmm. we've, we've worked successfully on a number mm -hmm. of locations, mm -hmm. and we'll continue to work with any other locations that's identified. If there's a temporary measure we could do until the longer program comes along, mm -hmm. we'll be happy to do that. Now, have we got an update? And I have civic leaders here I want to acknowledge from Rosedale, uh, both Jackie Campbell, and I have the president of Rosedale Civic here, Marcy O'Brien. So for the Brookville Triangle, and I understand there, the work has started, I believe, on Francis Lewis now. Um, can you speak to where we're at with that, the Brookville Triangle, which is right before State Road, as you know? Um, so we had have, have had conversations, I think, last month on where, what the status of that project is. 
And I believe where we left off was there was some acquisitions. So do we have anyone who can answer questions on where we're at with acquisitions? We'll work so on we getting you an update while we... Okay. While By we, the end I of don't today. know offhand, but I okay. do know we're making progress, so we'll get the update. Okay. I promise I would be sure. Sorry, Chair. I'm going to move to uh, my bill, Intro 268, so you're in support of this bill? Working on, on reporting. So we could, you know, work on most of the ones that you're suggesting and the ones that we can't. We'd like to work on coming up with the metric. Now, which ones do, are problematic for you? Uh... I, I think one, one, the first one was a little problematic, but we also think we could offer some additional metrics to make it more transparent. Okay, and um, just let's go through the um, backflow devices. How many times last year did the commissioner give a directive to building owners to install uh, backflow devices? So if you give me a minute, I have a chart here. So again, those would be at ones that we have found after the fact that required them. I mean, there's tons that are proactively doing that for the requirement, but you're talking about specifically ones that we've yeah. inspected and found. And then the question is, have we, t what is, so DEP likes to give a, a guesstimate on figures when it comes to backflow prevention devices and compliance rate. Um, so are you moving away from just giving estimates now? Or obviously, my bill is going to make you do more, but we'll why? work with you and give you whatever you want. I don't like guesstimates myself. Okay. If we could give you numbers, we're going to give you numbers. Okay. So you're going to report actual figures? Yeah. Okay. So I have here summons is issued for failure to install a backflow device is 956 for 2017. And that's out of a universe of. We have. Uh, 40 something plus thousand buildings that have devices. And how many are not in compliance? I don't have that figure right in front okay, of me. So we're gonna be looking for more info on that. And what um, enforcement actions do you take um, if a uh, building owner doesn't comply? So we send them an NOV and they have to report to the oath uh, for see a judge and then they get penalties and fines and they have time to come in with compliance. If they don't, they get another energy. How much time? From the commissioner's order, I think it's 30 days. And then from the NOV, when they go to alt, I think it's another 60 days for them to comply. And you find how often do people comply once I, they go through alt? I don't have that percentage. Okay, percentage. so we'll but look we for those get, numbers. We could, we could get you any, any metrics or any numbers you want. Now the fines are between 500, could vary between 500 and 5,000, right? Uh, they're, they vary, but it's, that sounds right. Yeah, and mostly, roughly. most of the time, it's roughly at the lower end, correct? Yeah, that's per oath, we don't have, it, that, yeah. we don't have any oath info. So what I'm getting at is there are individuals in the city who will eat the fine because a backflow device can cost between 3,000 and 20,000 dollars. So I think over time it does it won't remain on the small I, it will end up being more the fine will be heavier than that amount. But How often does that time, happen? I don't know. And what does overtime like look like? Because I think from what we see, so the, most of the, the time it's the lower end and and for the initial. So, so for the first the offense, offense process is, mm -hmm. is and then the second offense the costs escalate. I don't think. All right, can you give? If we want you know the cost. I, I don't have them in front of me, but if we want to work on it, raising the. Yeah. Fine. I'm, I'm happy right. to work with the council. Yeah. And coming so. up whatever we think is appropriate. All right. So that's something we're definitely interested in um, having further conversations on. Um, all right, Chair. I was short, I think. Um, we look forward to working with you on this bill. And, uh, and one of the reasons we believe in reporting bills is because transparency equals accountability. So although I, I really... I, and I agree, I hate doing reporting bills, um, but without them, you know, without information, it's very hard to, to make educated decisions. So look forward to working with you on this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Uh, Councilmember Menchaca. Thank you. And thanks for being here today, and thanks to my colleagues and our chair. Uh, it was a very important discussion about sewers in our communities. And I think the only thing that I wanted to add to the conversation was really around, or questions around um, the idea of having feedback from the community. 
the circle of feedback and how you get to say an intro for 24 uh, know what the frequency is for backups and how you're thinking about that in terms of how you do things today and how you do things post law being enacted. I want to know how you know what you know on the ground if sewers are being backed up. I mean, we know through largely through 311 complaints. So, we, well, so that's the only way that you, you get to see the understanding of... It's not the only way, but it's the it's the biggest way. I mean, we get things from council members, we get things through elected right. officials. There's different ways that we get information, but it's all kept track internally. But 311 makes up the bulk of that. And we encourage everyone to call 311 when they're experiencing a problem because that's what we use, of course, to, to use our data and to map it and see where the problems are. If we'd always encourage for more feedback because the more feedback we get, then we could try to solve the problems. If we don't know that you're experiencing a problem, we can't help to s or start to solve the problem. It's the easiest way through all agencies to be able to, to get, track, follow up on an issue. Um, some elected officials don't prefer not to use it, but we strongly advocate for people using it because it's also how data is interpreted and, and analyzed across agencies. So it's, it's a useful tool. And it sounds, well, I guess I want to get a mul uh, the multiple feed, uh, access points to information from the community. So 311 is, is one way. Yeah. Uh, elected officials that will call in an issue is another way. What other ways do you currently get information about what's happening on the ground? I mean, we, we have a community affairs department that's out in the community. We have you know borough coordinators that are out at community board meetings, at all types of different civic association meetings, so we capture data through that. Uh, you're not talking specifically about SBUs, I assume. You're just saying generally in terms of... I mean, I, th I think generally would be, would be a better, yeah. better sense. Uh, I mean... We also have almost 6,000 staff at DEP that work in the city or work you know, upstate in the city. So we, we have our ears open and you know, are running into things all the time. And, and, the, and the reason I, this bill, just take 424, is really built around a sense of understanding what's going on on the ground. Yep. So if you have some communities that are just like under-reporting for whatever reason, and there could be many barriers, it'd be interesting to hear from you what barriers currently exist to 311 being a kind of true uh, or close, closest to the truth about what's happening in a neighborhood mm -hmm. but I I think that there are issues with some of the some of the people that I represent the residents that I represent that are either take Red Hook for example who just don't call anymore because it doesn't work it doesn't mm -hmm. nothing happens um, is the sentiment, though I know we're working really hard in Red Hook. I, I know yeah. that. So yeah. I want to acknowledge that openly, but that's not necessarily the sentiment of a homeowner who just hasn't yet seen any relief whatsoever because this is a big problem. Right. And I can't imagine what's happening in Southeast Queens or other areas. And so 311 is the only place where you can get data and elected officials, but we're just still one person. We're not, I, I, I couldn't pretend like I, I know exactly what's happening on every single homeowner or renters basement but I'm just trying to really pose a bigger question about how, how do we get to that fuller sense yeah I think we're more than happy to hear of other suggestions or other you know methods that we should be doing of how you know how, how best to capture people that are either frustrated or unaware of how to access our services we're I feel like we have a pretty aggressive outreach unit and I don't think we're that hard to find when people have problems seems like we hear problems <laughs> a lot and are helpful but if there are things that we're not doing or other agencies or best practices that we could use we're all ears of what else we can do uh, one final question on, on just the outreach how how often are you getting non-english 311 complaints about sewer sewers uh, I don't we do track the different languages that come in through 311 and obviously 311 is capable of handling any language, uh, but I don't know specifically the, the numbers. Is it something you can get back to the chair on? Sure. On just, I want to get a sense of 
and there's like a heat map too of, of the city yeah. where where certain communities and, and I, I'd like to with the chair kind of analyze that with you because I sure. think that's another that's another barrier that I'd like to just get a better sense about what it, what that barrier is and yeah. then try to figure out how we can solve that sure. to anticipate a better sense of how how effective you you're being yeah uh, and and maybe do some pilot stuff in Red Hook. Uh, to regalvanize people's attention to this issue, yeah. and I think there's a lot of I'll fix it myself kind of situation, but it's connected to the broader system, and the broader system is is is, is broken. And, We'd be and happy to partner on that and okay. like interpret the data together and see what else we could be doing. Great, thanks to both of you for sure. Thanks to Councilmember Menchaca. So just piggybacking on that uh, for the cease the grease materials. Mm -hmm. And the interactions that we have with food establishments, uh, what languages are we prepared to speak on, or how, how are we interacting with the community uh, in different languages? Yeah, so we're complying. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the local law, but we're compli You know, we're in the process of getting everything to comply with the the language access. So, I believe it's 13 languages that we're required to have all the sort of critical information in. So we're translating that. We have the ability when people call to transfer them to an interpreter to be on the phone with us. Our p people out in the field have that as well as internally. Um, and for Cease to Greece, I think right now it's just Spanish and English, but I think we're looking to build that out and do more languages as well. All right, great, because we- So it's a know, work in progress. We're getting better okay, every Okay, because we're a city of, of so many languages, what, 190, yeah. I think, is, is somewhere that in that realm. and. Yep. Uh, being able to interact with especially not only with residents but business owners on compliance uh, is extremely important. Yeah, agreed. And that again, just to reiterate, they, there's a phone program that we have that if you encounter a, a communication issue, you can call and then they can help facilitate a conversation that all of our folks have. So okay, very, so if, very valuable. So if we have not limited to 13 or 11. Okay, or whatever. so if we have if someone goes uh, from DEP to a food establishment and starts talking about you know the compliance program, there's they can be transferred. They can put someone on the phone yeah. who can speak the language, so we Correct. can get that. Yeah. How many of uh, food service establishments have we inspected for compliance with fats, oils, and grease program? I don't have that available right now, but I'm happy to get it for you to follow. How many miles of sewer have been chemically treated for root control? So root control, we don't have a problem in the city sewers. Root control is more of a problem in the homeowner's service connections. That's mm -hmm. where you see a great an amount of uh, roots intrusion. Uh, how many miles of sewers have been inspected using CCTV technology? I don't, I don't have that figure in front of me, but it, it is a number we report on every year, and we could get that for you. Great. Um, how many miles of sewers have been cleaned as part of a preventative maintenance program? So we, we, I don't have that number with me, but we could get, get that for you. Okay. Um, so it's a rough going here today. <laughs> <laughs> rough going today. All right. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I certainly feel that we, we have enough common ground here. Yeah. to come put together a 424 and a 425 that aren't connected to results that are coming in 2021, right? I think that we're talking about, for the residents who live throughout the city, who have sewer backups, we're, they're glad, I'm sure they're very, very glad that you're doing the pilot program, as am I. Um, but they wanna see some action sooner, they wanna see a plan sooner, they wanna see that government, government is responding to them much sooner. Um, I really believe that we can find some common ground, uh, as my colleagues have uh, aptly stated. So I, I think that uh, I look forward to working uh, with you and my co-sponsors on the bill um, to come up with uh, pieces of legislation that make sense and that we can uh, deliver that don't interfere with your pilot but still get the results that we're looking for. Yeah, and I think we believe that we're making a lot of great progress and there's a way that we can definitely help to, to demonstrate that and show that we look forward to working. Great, I appreciate that. And with that, we'll uh, end the questioning for this particular panel. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panel is Arthur Clock and April McIver. If we could step forward.
two panels. I think we're good. All right. So as long as you're not reading me a four-hour presentation, no. uh, we are, we're going to we'll forego the clock and, and allow Don't you worry. guys to give, all, both panels to give their testimony as needed. So as okay. uh, long as it's not a four-hour PowerPoint presentation, I think we're good. So if you want to go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, good afternoon. My name is April McIver, and I am the Executive Director of the Plumbing Foundation, City of New York. The Plumbing Foundation was founded in 1986 and is a nonprofit organization of small and large union and non-union plumbing contractors, engineering associations, supply houses, and manufacturers whose mission is to protect the public health and safety through the enactment and enforcement of safe plumbing codes. We strongly support Council Member Richard's bill, intro number 268, but we are here today to provide recommendations on how to strengthen the bill's provisions. Uh, in an effort to not reiterate my entire written testimony, I will highlight uh, some of our major points. Uh, as you well know, backflow can occur when street pressure pushes water into buildings where dangerous materials and chemicals may exist, and no device prevents that now contaminated water from re-entering the drinking water supply. There have been countless cases of contamination caused by car washes, dry cleaners, and the biggest culprit, Mother Nature, all of which affect many homes and businesses throughout the city. With the increase in major weather events due to climate change, this may become a more frequent occurrence. The issue of backflow dates back decades. In 2007, the New York Times reported 85,000 large residential and commercial buildings lacked backflow prevention devices, and that 26,000 buildings in New York City were considered high risk. Ten years following the New York Times article in 2017, city limits reported residents in Queens and Brooklyn experiencing flooding in their basements of raw sewage, one resident said this occurs once a year and is a common problem in her Queens neighborhood. The article also cites to the 2016 administrative compliance order from the US EPA, which I think was mentioned earlier um, in this hearing. As you know, the New York State Department of Health Regulations requires suppliers of New York City, and as you know, New York City, that is DEP, to classify all buildings in terms of the degree of hazard they pose and a share appropriate appropriate devices are installed and tested annually. In, nine, uh, in 2009, the City Council adopted Local Law 76 uh, to address the ongoing issue with backflow, but it only required DEP to report the number of buildings with devices installed updated semi-annually. For purposes of transparency and compliance, it is not of much use to know the number of buildings with devices installed when there is no set universe of buildings that are required to have such devices. Therefore, no real compliance rate can be determined. As stated, we strongly support passage of intro number 268, but we recommend the council consider a number of revisions. First, the industry urges the council to require DP to report the actual number of buildings requiring a backflow prevention device, the actual number of installed devices, and the actual number of buildings that are not in compliance. And this is rather than what's in uh, the legislation right now, which just says estimate. In DEP's prior testimony dated October 30th, 2017, they claim they have made extensive efforts in the identification, inspection, enforcement, and reporting of backflow prevention devices. They also state they have an active database comprised of over, what they said today, 104,000 records of properties, and that those, rec those properties tracked are dynamic as the nature of a property's usage profile can change. Even with that, the foundation and the industry strongly believes that actual figures can still be reported each year. For instance, by reporting as of January 15th, 2019, X number of buildings requires devices, etc. cetera. Um, I do believe that DEP you know, mentioned they have data mining and field inspection, and it sounded like they had some updated numbers today, so we strongly believe they can be reporting these, these numbers annually. Uh, in addition, in the hearing transcript from October 30th, uh, the chairman asked DEP about fines imposed on owners for not installing the required backflow prevention devices. On pages 50 to 51 of the hearing transcript, DEP says fines are between $500 to $5,000, yet devices can cost anywhere from $3,000 to $20,000. This is why the industry believes fines should be increased so that owners do not continue merely paying the lower fines but rather comply with the law and actually install the required devices. The installation of backflow prevention devices should be a public health priority. 
It is apparent that the understanding of and compliance with backflow pre prevention is still an issue at large in the city. There is limited transparency on the part of DEP regarding enforcement, installation of backflow devices, and proper comprehensive reporting, all of which needs to change. We thank the chairman and the committee for their time today and the sponsor for consideration of our proposed amendments to intro number 268. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Hi, my name is Arthur Clock. Uh, I am the training director for Plumbers Local Union Number One, jointly administered labor and management fund. We operate a 40,000 square foot training center in Queens. In that facility, we operate something we call the Cross Connection Control Bureau, which is a New York State Department of Health regulated training program to certify backflow prevention device testers. These are the devices that we're talking about. They have to be tested annually. Um, in fact, it's the largest and most active certifying program of this type in New York State. Cross Connection Control Bureau training is open to any individual who needs this training. Um, students in the program study the causes and effects of backflow and learn the skills necessary to keep the equipment which prevents backflow in good working order. Uh, backflow is a very serious hazard. New York City Department of Environmental Protection operates our public water supply, controlling the water as it travels from source to consumer. However, once it, the water enters a building, they've lost control of it, right? It becomes exposed to a wide array of opportunities for contamination while it's being used inside a building. In our public water supply system, water is maintained at a significant pressure in the street mains to enable it to flow into the buildings from those mains. Water pressure in the street system, though, occasionally fails and more commonly is reduced when a water main breaks or if there is an unexpectedly high demand on the water system, for example, when fire hydrants are open. So if there is a fire or if there are uh, children playing in the street and they open a fire hydrant, you're going to get a drop in pressure in the system. Reduced pressure in the water main causes a reversal of flow wherein the water flows out of the buildings and back into the pipes in the street. This can be extremely dangerous because after the water has entered a building, it's being used by customers in ways which can cause it to become contaminated. Think of water used in boilers, cleaning facilities, medical facilities, commercial and industrial facilities being drawn back into the public water piping in the street and then traveling on and into another building and coming out of someone's faucet while they're cooking or taking a drink. The best defense against illness or death occurring from hazardous backflow events is a good backflow prevention program. In fact, a rigorous program prosecuted diligently and effectively is the only defense that there is, which is why it is mandated by both our state and federal governments. The need to install these safety devices, the New York State Department of Health requires suppliers of water to classify all connected buildings in terms of the degree of hazard they pose and to make sure backflow preventers are installed and tested annually. However, a great many buildings in New York City still lack the backflow preventers they are mandated to have, including many that are considered high-risk buildings. It is the absolute responsibility under the law for the purveyor of water, which is the DEP, to operate an effective backflow prevention program. Failure to do so opens the city to tremendous legal exposure if a catastrophic backflow event should occur, sickening or killing unsuspecting New Yorkers. The need to test and maintain these devices is very important. Approved backflow prevention assemblies should be tested at least annually as outlined by the American Water Works Association and all the manufacturer's literature. So these devices clearly say in their uh, owner manufacturer literature that they have to be tested. Annual failure rates of approved assemblies vary, but they do become fouled and fail over time. The AWWA and the manufacturers require testing at least every year to be sure that they're uh, functioning properly. If the device fails to operate when it is needed, it's useless because it's supposed to stop the water from coming out of the building. If it doesn't work, it, it didn't do anything. Um, when, you, when you install devices and then you fail to enforce the requirement for testing and maintaining them, uh, that does not protect the public. It only gives the public a false sense of security and it subverts the intention of the program. Uh, how to improve this bill? Uh, we have a host of possible backflow hazards to worry about in our interconnected grid of pipes which feed fire hydrants, commercial, industrial, and residential buildings. The ongoing danger is elevated when we do not really know if we have properly addressed the problem. In light of this, we recommend the Council consider additionally requiring the DEP to report the actual number of installed devices and the actual number of buildings requiring a device. It would seem that the DEP should be able to come up with those numbers uh, so we can all understand where we really are. In conclusion, Plumbers Local Union Number 1 strongly supports the Council Member Richard's bill and feels that intro 268, if enacted into law with additional requirements for the actual number of installed devices and the actual number of buildings that require a device, uh, will help keep New York City a healthy city. 
Uh, this time I'll pass it over to uh, Councilman Marie Yeager, and then I'll come back with my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Clock, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We want to make the bill as strong as possible. I think, actually, we've done, uh, Council Member Richards has uh, at least half of what you've asked for. Uh, subsection 3 of Subdivision 3 requires that the reporting include, quote, the number of all facilities in which backflow prevention devices have been installed to date. Does that not meet with what you're asking for? If they're going to give us a real number of how many backflow preventers there are installed, and these are containment devices that keep water from going back into their piping, uh, that would that would be what I'm talking. Well, about. that's they would only give it if we pass the law and require it, and they comply with it. But yes, so that would meet half of it. And then okay. the other half is uh, you've asked for uh, the actual number of buildings requiring a device, and what we've asked in the draft legislation, Councilmember Richards' uh, bill. Uh, intro 268 is the number of all facilities that the department estimates requires the installation of one or more backflow prevention devices. How can the department necessarily know how many buildings require it? This has been going on since the 1980s. Um, they they are have always taken the position that they don't know and can't know how many buildings require these devices. The building owners are uh, it's. They're required to either install a device or explain why they are exempt from installing the device because they don't have a hazardous condition. Only for the new buildings, right? Right. Okay. But, but all your existing buildings, I mean, it's as simple as, as asking them. I mean, it could be as simple as putting together a, a, a piece of paper that they have to fill out and return and say, you know, have you got any of these conditions in your building? And if you, if you do not have those conditions in your building, indicate that you don't have those conditions. And somebody should be able to, whether they have a, a survey done by a master plumber or they have an architect or an engineer certify that that's correct. The simple, uh, simple question is, do you or do you not need a backflow preventer? And if it's required, let's get one in there. If it's not required, tell us it's not required. But this is not, this is not new. This has gone on for 30 years. They still haven't found any method of, dis of discerning what buildings need these devices. It doesn't okay. make any sense. All right. Um, and now my, uh, my question very briefly for Ms. McIver. Um, did I get that right? MacGyver, yes. MacGyver, MacGyver. Okay, well, that's easy. I know that. Um, you represent the plumbing contractors, the engineering associations, the supply houses, and manufacturers. How much would the plumbing contractors, engineering associations, supply houses, and manufacturers like the fines to be if, as you indicate, uh, 50 to... Um, Fifty to one thousand dollars is not sufficient. Are you asking the actual what, number we what, would recommend? What fine would you like for somebody who didn't comply with the law? Well, how I think much? How much would the how much would New York City's plumbers like them to be fined? Um, I don't think that it has any direct impact on New York City's plumbers. It doesn't give. Well, you represent them. the plumbers, right? Yes, but okay. but in terms of building owners having to pay a fine, it doesn't make a lot of sense if they're saying, "Fine, I'll just pay a five hundred dollar fine," rather than installing some $10,000 device. It so doesn't. How much would the plumbers of New York and the associated and the engineering associations, the supply houses and the manufacturers like New York City's real property owners to be fined? What I is would the number you would like? The actual number up to the discretion of the city council, but it should coincide with what the property type is and what smaller or large device would be. So if it's a smaller property and I believe DEP uh, testified last year it could range from three thousand to twenty thousand dollar system depending on the property usage it should coincide with what that property's usage would be so i i imagine it would be on a sliding scale similar to what the actual cost of the device would be okay so you can you can estimate the cost of the device by the size of the of the water service so it's a two inch water service that's one thing if it's a six inch water service or a ten inch water service that's a different thing so the it could be on a sliding scale based on the size of the water service. So the fine should be equal to how much it would cost to install the device? At least, at least the prohibitive. I'm asking for the recommendation of yeah. the Plumbing Foundation of yeah. New York. If that's, no, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'm interested in, in, in uh, Local One's in, uh, input as well. But what I want is a number. How much do you think the fine should be? I came here to not vote for fines. How much do you think the fine <laughs> okay. should be? I, I Give me a number. agree with what I just said. I, I, if it's going to be a $3,000, if that's what that property usage would be, that's what the installation Equal to device. the price of the device. Yes. Gotcha. Local one. 
equal to the price of the device? The installation, the, the device itself is, is part of the cost. The labor is the other part of the cost. Equal to the price of the okay. device plus the installation. Yeah, or at least close enough to make it, uh, make it a choice. Either I, either I have to pay this fine and get nothing, or I have to do the installation plumbing, and then I'm done. Plumbing Foundation, same answer? I, I completely agree. Okay, I don't, Mr. But, but I just <laughs> okay. wanted to get the number. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Yeager. Um, I mean, you, you quoting my questions from last uh, from last hearing, so you sort of know where I stand here. But um, based on the testimony issued given by DEP today, do you agree with their statements on amending the bill for more transparency, or what are your state what are your thoughts on on the DEP's testimony today? Um, yeah, so I was actually happy to hear a lot of the numbers because I believe you know reviewing I was at the hearing last year and reviewing the testimony, uh, it seemed like. An, they couldn't answer a lot of the questions about the number of buildings that they issued violations for and what the compliance was. It seemed like they were very unclear. So this year, it seems they had um, more clear answers and more clear numbers from 2017, which is great. Um, that only tells me that they should be able to comply with what we're requesting, the actual numbers. Um, and it sounds like they're doing a great job with data mining, and I think that's that's actually great for transparency. So. I would like to know what other means they could uh, provide information, um, they, like they said, so. All right. On, on that same comment, I mean, when you have 30 years to determine how many buildings in your city <laughs> need to have a, a safety device installed, and after 30 years you can't answer that question, something's wrong. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's time for them to, to realize that 30 years is long enough, and if they don't have an answer, they need to do something to come up with an answer. Uh, I don't disagree. So, I mean, I've been a supporter of the bill for a long time. I look forward to working with uh, both your organizations to come up to a good resolution. I think that we can. So, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. And, Chairman. And at this you. point, we'll, uh, we'll move on to our next panel. But first, I want to recognize uh, Councilmember Ulrich, and I see he's got two special guests with us today. Yeah. <laughs> So Lily and Tiny, welcome. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have uh, uh, Marcia O'Brien, and we have Jackie Campbell. If you can come forward and testify, and welcome again, Lily and Tiny. Hi guys, good afternoon. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we're not going to do a clock, so um, we're just to give you a testimony, and we want to make sure we can hear um, your complete thoughts. Hmm? Okay, no problem. I appreciate it. All right. Okay. Please, please excuse my my voice. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman and Council Members. My name is Marcia O'Brien, and I'm the president of the 148th Drive and Community Block Association. I'm also a board member for Community Board 13, and I'm also the president and board chairperson of the Rosedale Civic Association. My council member was um, Donovan Richards. Um, thank you for inviting my testimony at this public hearing to address the problem of sewage backups that has disproportionately impact upon southeastern Queens. Since 1946, the Rosedale Civic Association has continuously maintained its mission to preserve and enhance <coughs> the quality of life of this southeastern Queens suburban enclave within New York City boundaries. As a longtime resident and homeowner in Rosedale, I raised two amazing young adults. One just graduated from college and the other one is um, doing pre-law. And as a longtime resident and homeowner with firsthand experience of the damage done by flooding in Southeast Queens, both to our homes and also to our businesses, I support with great fervor 
the city's intention to enact enhancements relating to backflow prevention, device reporting, and certification. I also support the methodology of reducing sewer system backups by requiring the city to prepare a plan to prevent sewer system backups. Such, such an effort is commendable and necessary. DEP should be required to vigorously investigate and inspect any locations that require backflow prevention devices and strictly enforce their installation and maintenance. Sewage and other contaminants entering our drinking water <clears throat> is a health hazard and it is unacceptable. The cleaning of the sewers on a regular basis is a necessity and a requirement that a plan be presented by the end of the year is a good way to push DEP to achieve that goal. However, any plan that truly seeks to solve this problem must acknowledge that the still unfinished sewer infrastructure in Southeast Queens will continue to cause backups because we do not have a complete system to take away debris and water. The system is thus still overloaded and backups will continue until we have a full build out. The 1.9 billion sewer construction for Southeast Queens won by our council members must be completed. Also a solution to the high water table issue that continues in parts of Southeast Queens must be implemented. As long as the standing water level is so close to the street surface, any strong rain or impediments in the sewers will lead to backups because there is absolutely no room beneath the street surface to accept storm water or deal with impediments. What is being proposed is commendable and will help and should be supported, but until the above issues are addressed, we will still risk sewer backups and flood conditions in our community. So I've left this document with most, and I thank the city's administration in advance for tackling these issues head on with analysis, capital, and implementation, and or organizations, along with the thousands of residents, support these two bills that are intended to address sewer backup that has disproportionately impacted Southern Queens. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. And excuse my voice again. No, no worries. Thank you for your testimony today. And I guess I'll ask, has DEP visited your civic association with the cease to Greece and all yes. of those they have? I invited DEP out to present and they did give us, give us a few handouts that we shared with residents. It was not a lot. It was just one sample degreaser container, um, and that's it. Um, I've not seen them at any of our community board meetings. I do sit on the board with Jackie. You have? Okay, so she has. Maybe I missed that one. But um, uh, probably about a year ago, um, they came out to the Rosedale Civic Association. So you, th you think that they, we can do a little bit more of a robust job, right? We can, we can yes. do a better job in getting the word out. Absolutely, absolutely. More outreach. Okay. Home visits, knock on the doors, drop off things, you know, drop off, I don't know, on, on the steps, containers, just to um, be more proactive in the community. Because although they claim that the, you're not getting a lot of complaints or they're not seeing the, a lot of complaints coming in from Southeast Queens, folks have given up. We have a lot of seniors who just feel that their voice is not being heard, and they just they just find ways to seek help themselves to deal with the situation. Well, that, that should never be the answer. Absolutely. That should never be the answer. We should always be able to help. So, um, you know, let's continue a conversation. Uh, we definitely will uh, take your information, and let's continue how we can 
work with DEP together and with Councilman Richards and, and Miller and, and come up with and Adrian Adams and all of our, our representatives in partnership and Eric Ulrich as well and, and come up with solutions on how we can get that outreach um, to, to sort of be tailored community by community in a better way. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Campbell. My name is Jackie. Microphone. Just gotta push the button, make sure the light's on. Hi, I hear me now? Yes. Yeah, I hear you, great, yes. thank you. My name is Jackie Campbell. I, mm -hmm. um, I'm a community board member, 13 member. Um, I'm also founder president of the Rosier Blocks Community Association, otherwise known as 147 Road Block and Community Association. And um, I'm a member of the JFK Airport um, Committee, among other things. Uh, I'm going to speak on a more a very personal level because um, I've been affected so much by this. I'm very passionate about it. I've been trying over the years to, to get some solution. Uh, I moved into my house in 1991, and from the very first time I, I moved in, um, I've been having uh, sewer backup problems. And I started paying a contractor, a, a, a sewer company, a maintenance company, to come and clean it once, my sewer once a year. Finally, they decided that um, they're going to do uh, put the camera down into the, the, the sewer line to find out what's going on. They found it was tree roots. Okay, so they recommend that every year I continue cleaning it because it was going to cost me too much to, to do the, the pipe, to change the pipe, so the, the, sewer, line, the sewer pipe in, in, in the yard on the street. So I continued doing that and until um, the, the city got their contract. Then I bought into that contract and then they found that I have a bigger problem, which they had to eventually, because of this, con this insurance now, I could, was able to change the pipes, and one of them was the sewer line leading to the street, connected to the street sewer, sewer, sewer line. So that was done last year, actually. So two times in five years, they did, they did the, the change the pipes, one in my yard, one in the street. So um, I am thinking, and I, I'm, I want to thank you for taking on this issue for, on our behalf, because Rosedale is an area that, as you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's basically built on water. And we have a lot of flooding problems here. All my neighbors do. And they come to me th asking what to do, because they don't. And, and part of the reason why you're hearing um, the, 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 you know, the, the underreporting is because of the contract that the city that we have with the city, so people call this contractor to do the the the, the, the work, and th then of course DP doesn't. I don't think they get that in their in their records or they get the numbers. But my neighbors call all the time, and and if you look on our streets, we have streets <coughs> where where they come and they, they do they do the work to change the pipes. So in any event, um, I I think DP needs to coordinate with the parks department, um, I guess parks and trees, and they are not even responding to this because of the tree roots. We have a lot of trees in Rosedale. And I think maybe city council can help us to help parks to, to, to partner with um, DEP because I'm sure if we, it's affecting our homes, it's affecting the, the, sewer, the sewer lines on the street as well. And there's some connection going on there. So I, th I think Parks Department and DEP need to work together somehow or coordinate to, to help us or to, to solve this root problem with the trees because they're not cutting the trees down because they, they said they're, they're healthy. But in the meantime, they're causing up problems to the homeowners and to residents. So um, I hope you hear my passion because it's really, really a problem. Uh, no, and I have 28 years of this. <coughs> and I'm so. sure it cost you quite a bit of money yes, to do did. all this. Yes, it did, and it has been. I hear you. No, look, I mean, I, I think we're always striving to bring agencies together to come up with solutions to real problems, right? And I know that there's issues with the sidewalks when it comes to tree roots. There's issues with the sewer with tree roots. Uh, you know, the, the homeowners are, are some sort of, sort of stuck with sort of a lot of the bill, and I think we want to coordinate better. I think we can definitely do that. So I'm happy, again, to, uh, we have some of the folks from DEP still in the room. I think we can have uh, um, some good discussions and sit down, again, with my colleagues. I'm happy to work with Eric and, 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 and Donovan and Adrian and, and Danique and, and come up with some good solutions um, for you. So make sure we get your information and we'll absolutely reach out.
And I thank you for taking this on on our behalf. Um, it's, it's, it's our pleasure. It's the work that we do. So thank you for being here today. We definitely appreciate both of you coming here and bringing your voices to the council. Uh, you know, we need, uh, you know, it's, it, we try to legislate and try to do the right thing. And it's good to hear what's actually happening in communities so we can tailor our legislation to the issues that are happening on the ground and not just on data and numbers, but what's happening to real people. Because uh, that's what this is all about, is making the lives of people better. Um, so I really appreciate your being here today and testimony and your testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so I want to thank all my colleagues for being here today. I want to thank Kalman Yeager, our council member from Brooklyn, for being here for the entirety of the hearing. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank our uh, staff attorney and, and uh, committee attorney, uh, Samara Swanston. Thank you. Uh, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer. Uh, my uh, legislative counsel, uh, Nick Wazowski, uh, and all of our sergeant arms and everyone who's doing the work today. So uh, with that, uh, we will uh, end this committee on the environmental protection. Thank you.